Welcome back, all you cool cats and kittens. Thanks for tuning in for another fun science lesson provided by the naturalist educators at Tricky Meadows Parks Foundation. My name is Sierra, and as part of our trout series, today we're going to be talking about aquatic macroinvertebrates. So what are aquatic macroinvertebrates exactly? Well, aquatic, or aqua, refers to water, and macro means big, or big enough for us to see without a microscope. Invertebrates means not having a backbone. Humans have a backbone, so we are vertebrates. These aquatic animals, on the other hand, are invertebrates. They do not have a backbone. So if we put it all together, an aquatic macroinvertebrate is a water bug that we can see with our naked eye. Throughout the rest of the presentation, we will refer to them as macros. Some macros spend their entire lives living in the water, but many only live in the water until they are mature. For example, mayflies will live in streams or rivers for months to years, but only live on land as an adult for a few days. As an adult, their main goal is to mate and lay their eggs in or near water so the cycle can repeat. Macros can live in all kinds of aquatic habit habitats. Some live in moving streams and rivers, others live in shallow ponds. Most macros are predators and will prey on other macros. However, they also eat plant material such as twigs, leaves, and algae. Some macros like to live in the soft soil at the bottom of lakes and ponds, while others prefer to collect food drifting along in the current. So why do we even care about this? Well, no matter the aquatic environment, Macros serve as an important food source for many predators, including our rainbow trout. However, different kinds of macros can tolerate different water conditions and levels of pollution. The presence or absence of certain macros can be used by scientists to determine if a water source is clean or polluted. For example, stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies, adults and larvae, are very intolerant of pollution meaning they cannot survive in polluted water. Therefore, water sources that contain stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies are assumed to have good water quality. However, if these macros are not found in a water source, it doesn't necessarily mean that the water quality is poor. Other natural factors should be investigated, such as the temperature and flow of the water source. There are also some macros that are moderately and fairly tolerant of pollution, such as the damselfly nymph, dragonfly nymph, crayfish, midge larva, and leech. These macros as adults are also moderately and fairly tolerant of pollution. On the other hand, there are also macros that are very tolerant of pollution, such as the aquatic worms, left-handed snail, and blood midge larva. These macros may indicate the presence of pollution in a water source and will survive in very polluted waters. Scientists love to study macros because they can tell us a lot about the biological condition of the water body. Water bodies with healthy biological conditions have a wide variety and high number of macros present, including many of the intolerant of pollution. Water sources with only pollution-tolerant species or very little diversity or abundance may indicate a less healthy water body. Overall, when the biological condition of a water source is healthy, the chemical and physical components of the habitat also tend to be in good condition. Next, we're going to talk about some other factors that affect the health of macros. There are many factors that influence the health of macros. Seasons are an important factor because macros thrive and survive when food is available. For example, the macros that eat algae are more abundant in the summer when algae is growing the most. Dissolved oxygen is another factor that affects the health of macros because macros breathe oxygen that is dissolved in the water. Oxygen can enter water through waves and rapids when more water comes into contact with air. Additionally, aquatic plants release oxygen into the water via photosynthesis. When macros are immature, many require high levels of oxygen in order to survive. Many macros also have preferences about the bottom of their stream, river, or pond. 
For example, some macros like to eat tiny food particles at the bottom and prefer a sandy or muddy floor. Unfortunately, nutrients are regularly added to our water sources from human sewage and waste, agricultural fertilizer, and manure. These sources of nutrient pollution can accelerate the growth of aquatic plants like algae. Eventually, these plants die and their decomposition by microorganisms can use up dissolved oxygen in the water. This leaves less oxygen for our macroinvertebrates. Additionally, when companies dump industrial pollutants, chemicals, and mining runoff into our rivers and streams and ponds, these pollutants can lower the pH of the water source, making the water more acidic. The acidic water will weaken the shells and exoskeletons of the macros, eventually killing them. Lastly, when vegetation near water sources like trees, grasses, and shrubs are removed, this takes away food sources and breeding grounds for our macros. There are many factors that affect the health of macroinvertebrates. However, because macros spend most of their lives in water, tend to respond to human disturbance in predictable ways, often live for a year or more, have limited mobility and cannot escape pollution, they are reliable indicators of biological health of our, water, of our waterways. Additionally, macros are easy to collect and identify and, as we have learned, differ in their tolerance to pollution, which explains why biologists have been studying them for decades. So how do you catch macros? Well, it's actually not too difficult, but definitely requires adult supervision since you'll likely be near potentially deep or fast-moving water. And all you'll need is a net, bucket, and some tall waterproof boots or shoes unless you don't mind getting your feet wet. So the first thing you're going to do is fill up your bucket with a little bit of water from your water source. Uh, next, you're going to use the net to lightly disturb the debris and the bottom sediment. Uh, macros are often found around the rocks, vegetation, and logs um, or sticks, and they like to burrow in the bottom sediment, so make sure to check in these areas. Dump all of your contents um, of your net into the bucket for inspection. Next, once you've collected some macros, um, it's helpful to view them in a smaller container, such as a petri dish or glass or cup, so go ahead and move some of them into a smaller container. And you can use a magnifying glass or just your, your eyes um, and observe the different macros um, that you've collected. And once you've um, spent some time observing the, and identifying the macros you've collected, um, don't forget to return them to their home. Um, remember that our macros are food for our rainbow trout and other um, aquatic species. And oversampling macros and not returning them to their home um, can negatively impact their health and the habitat for those animals. So let's make sure we don't leave them out for too long and that we return them to their home. Now that we have a better understanding of macroinvertebrates, let's dive into how we can identify them. We can practice using some of the images and videos we took at our trout release. Um, we gathered macros from both the pond and the Truckee River at... We identified the macros uh, we were using using a key like the one shown on your screen. And there are many uh, free web-based keys that can be used, as well as handheld keys that can be printed off. Uh, we will link to these keys in the video description below. Um, but you can print off uh, the pollution uh, macro key that might be helpful for the next few trivia games or just any of the keys that you uh, find useful. Um, we've also included a coloring activity link below uh, for identifying macros based on their pollution tolerance. So feel free to do that as you watch the video or afterwards. If we look at the identification key provided on your screen, you'll see the first thing we look for is the presence of a shell. If the macro does have a shell, we determine if it's a single or double. If the macro doesn't have a shell, we then look to see whether they have legs or not. We continue going through the decision tree the decision tree in this process until we've identified the macro we've captured. Now that you ha know how to use the identification keys, let's put your skills to the test. Please pause the video now if you wish to gather a pencil and a piece of paper to write down your macro identification guesses. Take a look at this picture to see how many macros you can identify. Feel free to pause the video as needed. Okay, let's see how you did. We'll start with the macro in the top left corner. If you guessed an adult mayfly, you would be correct. Mayfly adults are very pollution intolerant. Next, we have a midge larva. 
These macros are fairly pollution tolerant. We also have a stonefly adult, which is very intolerant of pollution, and a cranefly larva, which is moderately intolerant of pollution. The left-handed snail is one of our macros that is very tolerant of pollution, and these must be alive during the macro survey collection to be counted. Next is the caddisfly larva, which is very intolerant of pollution. And we also have a water penny larva, which is very intolerant of pollution. The damselfly nymph is moderately intolerant of pollution. And the adult dragonfly is also moderately intolerant of pollution. We also have an aquatic worm, which is very tolerant of pollution, and a leech, um, which is fairly tolerant of pollution. And then clams are mussels, which are moderately intolerant of pollution. And similar to the left-handed snails, they should be um, alive in order to be counted during our macro survey. Next, we have a stonefly nymph. These are very intolerant of pollution. And a tip that can help identify them is to look for two tails and two long antennae. The scud is next, which is moderately intolerant of pollution. And lastly, we have the mayfly nymph. These macros are very intolerant of pollution and can be identified by looking for their three tails. Now, let's take a look at this video of macros that we collected from the Truckee River at Oxbow Nature Study Area. Can you identify any of the macros present? If you can't identify any, try to think of their pollution tolerance. Feel free to pause and replay the video as needed. All right, let's take a look and see how well you did. The first thing that stands out to me is the large aquatic worm. These are very tolerant of pollution. Next, the large macro in the center of the petri dish that's to the left of the aquatic worm is a mayfly. These are very pollution intolerant. The macro laying on its side at the bottom of the petri dish is also a mayfly. Look at the tails, do you see three of them? This can help us identify mayflies. Now, the two macros playing on the right side of the petri dish might be a little harder to identify. However, if you guess the larger, darker macro that stays near the aquatic worm is a stonefly nymph, you'd be correct. These macros are very intolerant of pollution. And something that helps us identify stonefly nymphs is looking for their two tails and the two long antennae. Now, the smaller macro that skirts away towards the bottom of the petri dish is hard to see, but I'd guess that's likely a mayfly. Now, let's test out your macro ID skills on a video of a macro we took at the Oxbow Pond. This video shows a macro undulating or moving in wave-like movements. If you guess this macro is a caddisfly larva, you are correct. You may have guessed a midge larva. However, Take note of a hair or whisker-like tendrils at one end of this caddisfly. This is likely their two hooked pro legs, which midges don't have. Overall, the Truckee River had many more pollution intolerant species, especially mayflies, compared to the Oxbow Pond. The river also has more diversity in macros collected. Based on our macro data collection, we believe the Truckee River to be a better habitat for our trout. There will be plenty of food, the macros, and the abundant presence of pollution intolerant macros indicates a healthy habitat with limited pollution. Thanks for tuning in for another Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation science lesson. We hope you had fun learning about aquatic macroinvertebrates. Please share pictures or videos of the macros you find in your community with us on Facebook at Truckee Meadows Parks Foundation or Instagram at TM Parks Foundation. Have ideas for other experiments or scientific topics you would like to learn more about? Leave a comment in the comment section below with your ideas. Until next time, don't forget to be a steward.